So yeah, welcome everybody to our first banner webinar of the year. Hope everyone had a great holiday. And um, here by popular request from the teachers, we have a presentation from Greg Newman from the Natural Resource Ecology Lab at um, Colorado State on his work in citizen science um, programs and online platforms. So I'm going to let Greg take the stage and um, tell you more about himself and his work. You bet. Yeah, thanks, Beth. And thanks, Amanda and Beth and everyone for organizing the webinar. Um, it's a fun opportunity to talk to you guys today. Um, certainly, we can have a, by any means, ch everybody chime in. Um, feel free to send your thoughts and comments in the chat window and that kind of thing um, as I go through this. I, I'm not sure exactly all your background in citizen science, so I think I'll start the uh, discussion with a kind of a brief overview of citizen science and then hopefully give you some perspectives of the um, opportunities certain platforms a platform we're working on here at uh, the Natural Resource Ecology Lab um, called sitside.org might offer citizen science um, programs and student engagement in monitoring forest health for example um, whether it be biofuels or biomass or you know tree infestation or things of that nature um, so what I'll do is kind of first um, as an overview kind of go summarize citizen science in general and then talk about tools that facilitate and support citizen science data collection, analysis, management, and visualization. So with that, um, are there any questions as before I jump in? Hopefully that makes sense to folks. So yeah, so let's see. Um, I wanted to show this screen. Hopefully you guys can see um, kind of this, the, the first slide here and I wanted to first pose a question so for those who do want to chime in as I kind of pose this question feel free to unmute yourself if you can on GoToMeeting but my question is what are we looking at here um, I'm wondering if anyone has any guesses as to the phenomenon we're watching as um, we move from March to April 2008 to May to um, June and then into July and August here. Any thoughts on what we're looking at um, throughout the U.S.? And for those, if you can and have some thoughts, either type in to the chat or just uh, unmute and feel free to chime in. Any ideas? Looks like we've got most of you muted. Um, Beth, do you have any thoughts? Um, bird migration? I don't know. That's a great guess. You nailed it. Um, yeah, so what, what we're doing is, is this is a, all uh, through the ability of citizen science, we're able to look at the Savannah Sparrow migration through time um, on this slide in, in the year 2008. And the only way we were able to do that is, is through the power of citizen science. And how that happened was the, um, the Cornell Lab of Ornithology had created a, an online platform called eBird in which um, amateur birders and um, enthusiasts were recording the observations of the Savannah Sparrow throughout um, the many, many years, in this case 2008. And then modelers at the Cornell Lab well, it took that data and um, looked at habitat suitability and basically modeled where this species may migrate through time. And so my my only point in showing that slide is is that um, that that w this type of migration would not be known if it weren't for citizen observations. So. Um, Generally, if we think of science, we think of you know t asking a research question, doing some background research, and conducting or constructing hypotheses to test experimentally, um, and then trying to what de determine whether that hypothesis was proven true or um, falsified, etc. And um, but in reality, really, kind of who does this? Who has the resources to do that? And if we're thinking about it from a community perspective or a student engagement perspective. Um, the, the situation might look different. And so I like to look at things like this and we might see things looking, communities keeping track and we might want to keep track of mean annual precipitation, mean annual temperature if we're scientists and we might see maybe um, 
our you know society has been kind of a period of business as usual and then some intervention maybe we want to change a behavior and then see what that intervention might have on on the trends we're monitoring and so in our case we might look at the number of beetle killed trees maybe we look at changes in climate and see how that's affecting that response variable or like tree biomass for example so in citizen science we, we, I like to think of things and, and our team we like to think of things as looking at things happening in the world and that phenomenon is happening we might be reacting to that phenomenon and it might encourage us to start gathering information to think about well why is this phenomenon happening um, and then that might lead us to develop some potential explanations like those hypotheses we talked about and maybe even design some data collection protocols um, where we then send can collect data and analyze that data and, in, and begin to interpret it to see if there's meaning in the data we collect and share that information and our conclusions with our colleagues. And so that would allow us to maybe adapt to the, the phenomenon we are observing and potentially even change our behavior. So um, in citizen science, there has been a lot of different descriptions of um, different um, topologies or categorizations of how citizen science happens and not all citizen science is the same there's a lot of flavors of citizen science so we can think of the, in, in 2009 Finn Danielson and others published a paper on what he basically called category one through five of different what he called community-based monitoring efforts and those involved category one that was externally driven and professionally executed that's your traditional academic scientific model whereas category two was externally driven meaning a, an academic came to a community and said we have this and that research question but then that community helped with local data collection Category three then unfolds into more collaborative monitoring efforts with external data interpretation where the scientists then interpret the meaning of the data collected collaboratively by the community Finally, well, close to finally here, category four is where we have collaborative monitoring with local data interpretation. And then all the way down to category five, which is more co-created models, where it's really grassroots and organically formed, where it's what they call autonomous local monitoring. A, a separate topology more recently was published in 2012 by Jennifer Shirk and others, and it was echoing um, comments and thoughts from Rick Bonney's publication in 2009, where they described citizen science as either contributory, collaborative, and co-created. On the margins of those were contractual and collegial citizen science projects. And you can think of contributory projects more as those kind of top-down category one, two, where scientists are really actively involved in determining the research questions and the community's role is centered on contribution, right? Contributing um, data collection um, efforts. Um, collaborative is more in the middle and co-created is more the bottom-up uh, grassroots approaches to citizen science. And so if we look at these from that with the process of citizen science we can see that in contributory models the public involvement whether them students in, in, in classes, high school biology or whether them uh, nature center where there's a citizen science program run through a nature center regardless those participants in that citizen science project really focus on collecting and perhaps analyzing data. In collaborative models those participants are more involved in more steps of that research process including developing the explanations and the questions to be answered and maybe doing a little bit more data analysis all the way up to co-created models where really the, the question came from the community so you might have a group like here in Fort Collins you know save the Pruder who is concerned about XYZ water quality issue and so they actually come up with and are concerned about their own research question in more of a co-created way so this relates to finally uh, um, another thing that kind of falls in line with these types of things is the what's called the citizen participation ladder and this was published by Craig in 2002 and a couple other folks in 1993 where they were really looking at the public right to know informing the public the public right to object um, public participation in defining interest actors and determining agenda so that's you know kind of getting the public more involved in who is studying what and why all the way up to 
to public participation in decision making. Um, so that's just kind of a very broad overview of citizen science and how we can conceptualize how different citizen science efforts can and, and do take place. Um, so as high school biology teachers, you might be thinking about how, how you might want to be unfolding citizen science in your classrooms pertaining to the, the banner project um, and its research questions. So with that background kind of underway, um, so far so good. If there are any questions, feel free to j jump them into the chat window. Um, or chime in by all means. Um, but um, with that background, um, our research team at the Natural Resource Ecology Lab at Colorado State University have been involved in an effort now for close to eight years, I think, um, with support from the National Science Foundation and many other organizations to develop some support platforms that support the needs of citizen science projects, um, whether they be co-created or contributory. And our mission to do so is to focus on providing comprehensive support for citizen science programs globally. And I'll get into what I mean by com what comprehensive support in a little bit here, but our team is really focused on thinking broadly about what um, what types of tools and platform support citizen science projects need and how can we best support those needs. So specifically our goals are to support the full spectrum of citizen science needs, elevate the rigor of citizen science data, and thirdly, improve data standardization, interoperability, integration, accessibility, and dissemination. So, and what we mean by that is, is that if citizen science efforts are conducted, say, in Missoula, Montana, I know some of you are in, in that neck of the woods, um, and you've got a classroom and you're measuring, say, diameter of trees to get, you know, forest structure and composition, and someone else is doing that in um, Arizona, um, there, if the protocols those two citizen science projects adopt and, and use in their efforts are the same, then the, the, the way we can standardize those data helps us bring those data together for what's called a meta-analysis. And what that means is, is that researchers um, and scientists can merge and integrate data from both citizen science projects into a single data set and, and then ask regional questions about that forest stand composition question that each of those separate projects were asking. So that's kind of what the data integration and standardization and interoperability uh, means. So basically our goal here at the Natural Resource Ecology Lab is to build platforms that provide comprehensive support for anyone anywhere to create and enact projects themselves and be sure that they have the confidence that their projects will be rigorous, advance scientific understanding, and yield positive actions and outcomes. We're really trying to make sure we add, we add and encourage rigor into the citizen science process and also move towards impacts and outcomes um, so that we can hopefully have po positive um, changes made um, to improve our well-being in, in the world. So with that, we might say, well, how do we accomplish that? And for any citizen science project, this is very traditional. You do need to ask, what is the research question you're trying to answer? Um, and how might you gather the information to answer that question? Um, what types of hy hypotheses you might have to explain um, what might happen um, and what you might find? and then um, choose your methods, collect your data, analyze your data, interpret your data, share it, and evaluate, and key, 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 evaluate success. And evaluation doesn't only mean, since it's at the bottom of this list, that it's at the very end of the process. It's actually very important to do formative assessments at the beginning and evaluate um, how you plan to go about this and how do you plan to evaluate your success throughout your process, as well as then um, summative evaluation at the end to try to determine, did you meet your goals and objectives? So um, a lot of times citizen science projects um, get started because of either a, you know, a classroom or a nature center or a science museum or a zoo says, geez, I've heard of this thing called citizen science and I'd like to go do citizen science. So they say, this will be great. I'll go start a project. I'll find some participants and um, 
Sorry, I just had a little interruption now. So uh, you know, I'll find uh, some participants, and you know, maybe I'll get some data collection protocols established, and we're um, and we'll be off our, off on our merry way, collecting data, and it'll be great. And this looks very simple, but in reality, um, what really needs to be done. Hold on one second, Hugh. Um, in reality, the the process of of this is much more complicated, and so you have to think about very very detailed tasks all the way from kind of like creating a logic model. If you've heard of those, what are your short term outcomes? What are your long term outcomes? Um, and Managing members, you might have um, certain members that have certain expertise taxonomically that they might have a, a greater permission role than other members. Uh, managing and identifying protocols, developing trainings. Are those trainings going to be conducted online or in the classroom? Are you going to do field days? And if you're going to do those field days, do you have permission to get on the National Forest and conduct those field days and trainings so that your students can learn the protocols? So as you can see, um, this gets a lot more complicated. You might have to order supplies, maybe. Is someone trying to call me? Can you pick that up? Is everybody hearing me okay, Beth? So far, so far, so good? Okay. Okay, good. Thanks. Thanks for those on the chat room. Sorry, I just, I mean, it's coincidence I might be getting a phone call from someone else and uh, I just thought it was one of you guys calling to make sure. So in any event, sorry, um, thanks for the yeses. Um, I think we're okay. So, and obviously if you're doing trainings, you might have students out in the field, you got to make sure they're well hydrated, you have to, I like to joke around and say, well, you got <laughs> you to buy burritos for your, your members. Um, and then you got to do quality assurance, quality control, you might have to order those supplies, you have to create graphs, choose which graphs are correct run statistics um, and summarize and visualize data, maybe author reports and share those reports and even write metadata about explaining how your students or your citizen scientists um, conducted the work they did. And then of course get feedback from all those participating to say did this work, um, what could be done better next year in the next year's sampling effort for example. So um, my only point here is, is to say that it, you might think that citizen science, let's just do it, it sounds great, this is going to be fun, but in reality it's, it's, a, it's a significant undertaking and so you need to be aware of that. Um, so next slide. Um, and that's not all. Um, as we mentioned, there's a lot of different ways you can do citizen science to what we call design models. There's different ways members can participate, um, different governance models associated with that. There's dis different types of data that can be collected. You can con collect qualitative data. You could conduct or uh, collect quantitative data. You could collect photos, videos, um, so that the actual nature of the data that you have your know, participants collect can vary quite substantially. As can, of course, the protocols that they follow. Um, you can do belt transects, you can do point observations. Um, for those of you in the forest um, community, you might be doing these um, forest health monitoring plots, for example. So we've conceptualized these various, um, for the breadth of the field with this um, with this slide and basically these are the different design models and governance models we've kind of been able to see and they include as I mentioned in the in the beginning the contributory collaborative and co-created citizen science projects as from a design standpoint and that's who's participating and how. Um, from a governance standpoint there might be threatened and endangered species that are sensitive species and um, you know, there might be where you want to have a manager like a teacher who manages and approves student accounts and those student accounts then enter data and have the privilege of entering data because those students have been trained. So you might think of that as a manager hierarchical model. 
or manage or mediated model. And then you can do truly crowdsourcing in citizen science where there are many examples of this such as the Galaxy Zoo project where anyone literally without training, well I shouldn't say without training, but anyone can sign up and, and train themselves in an online sense and contribute to a citizen science project like Galaxy Zoo where you characterize the classification of different galaxies in the Hubble telescope data set. And so you can say is this spherical galaxy or elliptical and you'll basically do performing image classification tasks. So that would be more crowdsourcing approaches and um, they're very much more public and open. As I mentioned, the data collected can vary from text to categorical data to numerical, integer, decimal data, and multimedia. And then finally, protocols can be plots and different sampling designs. Are they opportunistic, um, random, etc.? And so my only point here is, is there's a lot to think about and fortunately with any citizen science project you have usually scientific liaisons either here at the Banner Project, um, at the Natural Resource Ecology Lab or the University of Montana um, to partner with or for service staff for example to get advice on these um, different aspects of the citizen science you are going to do. Um, and that kind of brings me to implementation and wh what we've been trying to do, our team is really motivated by the complexity of implementing a project. And so what we're really motivated to do is, is try to ease the burden of those wishing to do citizen science by providing a suite of tools that make it a little easier so that you can focus on the really critical questions of what's your research question and forming relationships with your volunteers or, and or students and actually collecting data and looking at that data so that you can really put your mind to those important tasks and not be burdened by technology or you know data visualization and things that might you might take you a long time to figure out in a relational database like Microsoft Access or, or if you're using Excel how do you do macros to create an equation to to create a chart to look at you know some of the to trends your data should, may show and so to do so we built this web platform called sitside.org and um, I know Amanda's looked at it and um, several folks here at the Natural Resource Ecology Lab have looked at it but by and large we have over now 120 projects in globally using sitside.org that um, are embarking on citizen science in their own way. We like to say they're scratching their own itch. They might be measuring bats, birds, fish, frogs, streams, um, the productivity of maple syrup trees and generating maple syrup. They might be looking at invasive species, aquatic invasive species. They might be concerned about eutrophication in a lake or they might be concerned about beetle kill and the effect of beetle kill on forest productivity for example um, that might be relevant to the banner project. Um, we've got everything from pikas to streams to to bats, to amphibians, for example. Projects, many diverse projects, over 120 on sitside.org. Um, and this is the home page and I'll kind of do, I'll switch out of this PowerPoint mode and de delve into a, a demonstration of the site in a little bit. But I'm going to give a few screenshots and kind of highlight a few of the capabilities of this um, website that we have built. Um, like I mentioned, you can create your own project to kind of scratch your own itch. Um, and you can even customize your own inter user interface. I, I show this just to illustrate that we really believe that this, these tools really should be um, flexible and customizable to meet an individual citizen science project's needs. So if you buy, for example, a smartphone, um, not by and large, the first thing everybody does is changes their wallpaper or a computer, right? You put a new screen to make it custom to you. And so we believe you should be able to make it unique to yourself, to your project, and and be able to actually modify the user interface. So um, we kind of provide a templatized project profile, much like a Facebook profile page for each project and on this page you can actually manage these tabs and you can not show certain tabs or you can um, move the, the order of different tabs around. And so the, in that way, for example, you're at the end of the field season and you want to emphasize feedback so that your participants upon arriving at your page, the first thing they see is the feedback tab rather than view data. And So you can move, move these tabs around 
to your liking. Um, you can manage members, you can invite members through an evite system we've built where you can click uh, evite and basically fill out a participant's email address whether that be a trained citizen science uh, citizen scientist or a trained student for example in your class and you can fill out that student email and it'll send them an email and they can, they're already registered and and approved as a member of your project and and as such though that approved member can then enter data um, as trained. Um, other members can just click join and ask to join your project if that happens you'll get an email um, saying that this member has asked, asked to join your project. So there's project management and people management in sitside.org. One of the things that we really have emphasized and really is kind of at the heart of sitside.org is our data sheet creator. So not only can you manage members, but of course you need to define protocols and create measurements and create data sheets for those approved members to use to enter and submit data. And this is where they go to do that. Um, all things happen here at the data sheet creator. You can preview your data sheet at any time, save it, and um, you can create, of course, you create a unique name, add some instructions for your volunteers, and then in this area here where it says locations entered by user or predefined. Um, that, what that means is, is are your volunteers out with a GPS unit or smartphone device or some location um, device to say, okay, I found a fox at this location and I'd like to report that fox at that location. Or rather, have you predefined that you would like your students or volunteers or citizen scientists to continually go to, say, a particular location along a road or like a crossing of a creek and say I'd like you to always measure say water quality at that um, stream gauge for example and in that way you're doing more of what's called community-based monitoring where you're doing repeat measurements of the same measurement over time to look at trends say in forest health or water quality and so in that case you would use these predefined locations and you would tell the system where you want your volunteers to go and you'd name each of those locations uniquely um, that suits your needs. So then you can choose different observation types. These can be transects, these can be nested scale plots, and they can be simple point observations. Um, and then finally, um, you kind of build with like building blocks, like with Legos. You're basically building this data sheet up. So you're adding organisms and you say, I would like my volunteers to measure foxes. So you click the add organism button and pick fox and it shows up in your data sheet. Or if you wanted to do a species pick list, you could say I'd like actually them to measure foxes, bats, and frogs, and so you pick those species and they then they would then pre be presented with a pick list and they say I found a fox or rather I found a bat. Um, and then you can do an any organism pick list to say well this is more of like for a bio blitz. Uh, many of you may have had your classrooms um, be involved in a bio blitz and so that's a great way to say what did you find? We don't know what you're going to encounter out there in the world and so they, they then pick themselves what they found. And then for each one of these species, whether they be in a pick list or a bio blitz mode, you can add a measurement and those measurements can be anything you might need such as the diameter at breast height of a tree or the height of the tree or the depth of soil or the temperature of water, etc. And there's a growing list of measurements that we'll demonstrate later um, that are indi indicative of what's being measured today but if that list doesn't include what you need you can add your own measurement to suit your citizen science needs. So that's the data sheet creator and this is where um, as I was mentioning, you can collaboratively define attributes. So we mean collaboratively because, as I mentioned before, a classroom in Montana might want to share a measurement of diameter at breast height, for example, for a tree with a project in Arizona, for example. So this is how they show. This is kind of the, the growing list of um, of uh, measurements and they can be species measurements about an, an organism, a fox, a bat, etc. or they can be a site characteristic about the location you are measuring. So as I mentioned those predefined monitoring locations this is an example of plot one, two, and three and if you have been conducting citizen science for a long time and measuring certain parameters um, you can uh, 
add an Excel file, basically a, a comma separated file or a tab delimited text file of data in bulk to the system. So this is um, how you view data and I'll just kind of delve into a demonstration here soon because that will be a little bit better. But you can view data by observations on a map or by locations. And then finally, we've been working on ways to visualize and explore um, through data exploration means um, different data that your project has collected, and that includes trends, um, trends in air temperature through time, complete with um, summary statistics and descriptive statistics. This is a frequency distribution of that particular measurement, air temperature, and it, you know this is the distribution of, of measurements that your project has amassed, the mean, min, max, and standard deviation, and number of samples, and those are all dynamically updated as um, data are contributed. And then comparisons across sites, you can visualize different comparisons to look at which sites are high and low, and finally get feedback using what's basically like a survey monkey tool where you can create your own custom survey and have um, students or citizen scientists give you feedback at the end of each field season. And then finally, there's a version one of a mobile application that supports a subset of all of these capabilities, and we're working on a version two um, as we go forward. So with that, we're not quite there. We're not supporting all of this, the theory and practice of citizen science. Our team is eagerly um, pursuing various support of more facets of citizen science. And our next steps are to kind of support broader support for different design models, different governance models, of course, our version 2 mobile app, as I mentioned, and really emphasize making sure that we um, collect and capture and share metadata about what has been done so that other people who are using the data your citizen science project creates um, knows what was done and how that data could be used for those meta-analyses I was talking about. We have a feature Friday webinar series every Friday um, in addition to this banner webinar um, series that you're welcome to join and there's information on our homepage about our feature Friday webinar series. And then of course we're also trying to share data with other data repositories like sitsci.org such as the Encyclopedia of Life and the Global Biodiversity Information Facility. Um, one thing to, find, to kind of, in conclusion, however, be mindful of is, is citizen science is a great tool, and it's useful in many, many situations, but it isn't the be-all, end-all answer to all scientific questions and public science in you know literacy and public engagement um, problems. It's, it's a great tool, but it's not for everything, and so you need to um, be mindful of that and make sure you're picking the right tools for the right job. Um, and the much more research needs to be done about how to best do citizen science um, to achieve the um, goals and objectives that you have. So with that, I'm going to jump into, we have, let's see, about 15 minutes left of my presentation, and then we have 15 minutes reserved for any questions you might have. Um, so with that, I'm going to jump into a website demonstration of sitside.org to give you a bit of a flavor for um, what uh, this this site does and how it kind of works. So if you're when you first go to sitside.org and you arrive at the home page, you see a, a suite of a variety of things. One is a new discovery. And it's kind of fun to just check out who has discovered what recently. So as of yesterday, this guy Tom had made an observation in Bear Creek. And if you go click on that link, you can then see that he took a photo. This was in um, near Lake Erie, so it's very cold at the moment um, up in that area. So there's so snow on the ground. And Tom measured a variety of parameters, including air temperature, water temperature, connectivity, total dissolved solids, water pH, stream cross-section or area, and turbidity at this location. And if you're interested in Bear Creek in particular, this is a very public open system. You can yourself explore what's going on at Bear Creek by looking at some trends over time in air temperature and those descriptive statistics I was showing you and say total dissolved solids through time. And you can look at, okay, so there was more 
total dissolved solids in October of 2014 than there is today, January 2015. And so this is kind of um, exciting for the volunteer, especially who had contributed this, this, this information. At any time, you can look at the project that this data is in, and this happens to be a project that takes some time to load because this is a very active project. But this project has amassed 42,000 measurements at 405 locations um, that have been observed. Each location can be observed more than once. And so we've got 4,000 observations um, at those 400 in five locations. There's 92 members in this citizen science project and it was formed by Trout Unlimited. They call themselves the Trout Unlimited Cold Water Conservation Core Water Quality Monitoring Project. You can learn more by clicking on the details and you can look at team members and the number of observations various team members have made and you can submit data if you're a member of this project. You can view data just because it's exciting to look at and certain things require like giving feedback is you do have to be a member to give feedback to the project coordinator. To find all projects, if we go back to the home page, um, that was just a single new discovery, a more, most recent discovery. These are um, featured projects, so you can look at different projects um, that are featured, but you can always go to all projects alphabetically. And this is some bio blitzes, some um, you know, maple syrup studies, um, more bio blitzes, and you can scroll through these projects and you can look at invasive species and you can look at like pica observations for example um, and you can also search for how many projects happen to be studying the American pica and we happen to have five of them one of which is our very own front range pica project in this neck of the woods so in this case volunteers do in fact take photos as well of their observations and um, you can see the data they're working on. So back to that project list, I might just jump onto an example project by Trout Unlimited as well. Um, we'll look at West Virginia and Virginia for the sake of today. This is a little bit smaller project, um, but it'll give us an, a good flavor of how to do this. So if you're a member, you'll see enter data here instead of preview for this data sheet. So if I were to log in, I might not be a member of this project, but if I were, I'm going to log in, I would click submit data and I'd see, okay, so I am a member of this project. I would see this enter data rather than preview. And if I were to enter data, the way this works for the volunteer is, is very simple. They just they request to join the project. They get trained at a local library or classroom. They're trained in how to do this. They've got some instructions here, and then they fill out this, this data sheet. And since they happen to set up predefined monitoring locations, we can say I went to Beaver Creek, and the map will give me confirmation of where Beaver Creek is, and I'm like, yep, I'm in the right spot. And so at this spot, I measured, so you can pick yourself in this project, here I am, and maybe you might have an authority, like a project coordinator going out with you, um, so we're, we're, we'll pick a coordinator, for example, and this is just an illustration. And then you can fill out comments of this observation. And then the project coordinator had created this data sheet. So the project coordinator specified that they like they would like us volunteers or citizen scientists or students to measure subjective weather. Um, they would like us to measure precipitation in the last 48 hours, um, stream flow. These are categorical data. They would like us to measure connectivity in micro siemens per centimeter. They would like us to measure pH, etc. And so you click submit and when you do, you get an observation in this project. And so what that looks like is an observation on today, most recently, and you can then see um, the latitude longitude of that location. If there was a photo taken, it would appear, the location name, and you can view that, that location, that observation. So when you go view it, you see all the data that you submitted. This is what you would see when you, as a confirmation page, if it had I hit submit. And since you are the person who submitted this data, you can edit it if you made a mistake. Um, project coordinators can also edit um, people's data as it uh, is entered. But you yourself can edit, edit your own data um, just in, in the event that you happen to make a typo. Um, so. 
let's see. Can you search according to location? I saw a good thing in the a good question in the chat box. Thank you, Michelle, for your question. Um, you can search for existing citizen science projects in your area, and I'll do that real quick here. You can go to maps, and you can see who's doing what where. And so what this is is the is the centroid of citizen science projects. Of course, projects span many areas, but this is but consider it. Um, project headquarters. So these pins are project headquarters for a variety of projects. If you click on this, this project that I just clicked is the Tamaris Coalition in the Southwest and you can click project details and find out more about that project. If we go up here to the Pacific Northwest, here's a Puget Sound Marine Observations um, and you can zoom in by clicking and you can get more precise about which project you're looking at this might be, uh, that's a dragonfly project, and I don't know if I can find, like, here's the Summit County Forest Health Task Force, for example. Um, the other thing you can do is you can open up the project data, uh, different projects, and you can look by name, and this is the same as this list of projects, and so we can toggle on the Front Range PICA project. And if we do that and toggle off everybody else, we can then see, hopefully, um, the Front Range PICA project and all of its observations. So that's a good question, Michelle, and that's how you can do that. So let's see. I'll go back to um, my trout example just because it's a good example for today. And when you're here, if you're a project coordinator, I wanted to real quick get into how to create data sheets because it's a really key component to sitside.org. So if you're a coordinator of a project, you can uh, add a new data sheet, and maybe that's what I'll do for the sake of demonstration. And this data sheet might be, I don't know, let's see, it's Trout Unlimited, but we can just hypothetically say, you know, tree biomass um, or tree diameter citizen science um, data sheet. So if we do that, we might have some instructions and this might be a point observation and they might be predefined. So let's say that I have some known locations in Colorado, for example, that I know, you know, Fort Collins, we're going to measure the diameter of trees maybe in Roosevelt National Forest here in our backyard. And so it's going to pre-populate your latitude longitude and we can say plot one and submit that predefined location. And there it is. And we can add a second location. It will remember my previous locations. Um, and so you can change it to a different location and you can actually type in exact latitude longitudes if you know them. Um, and we call it plot two here and we submit. So now I've got two predefined locations and I want to measure the diameter of lodgepole pine, let's say. So I can add a plant and I can search for lodgepole and it's going to search through all of our species in our taxonomic backbone which fortunately came from the International Taxonomic Information System, and I can look for Pinus contorta, and I can select Pinus contorta, and then I can add a measurement of that species, and I can say DBH, so I can search for anything that starts with DB, and I can find DBH, and it happens to already be in the system, so I'm, I'm fortunate. And I can measure this in centimeters or um, whichever unit of choice I want to measure it. If I wanted to measure the height of lodgepole pine as well, I could measure, add measurement, search for height, and find height, and um, measure it in, say, meters. So I could search for that unit and select it, and measure it. If, however, I wanted a pick list of organisms, maybe I wanted to measure the height of three different um, conifer trees, I might say add predefined organism pick list. And then I can, to this pick list, I can add a species such as aspen and search for aspen and hopefully I find populus, maybe not. So if I might just go with scientific name because it's a little easier or if I can type right, here we go. 
So we're searching through all of these species and I find Populus and maybe I can find Trem for Tremuloides. And there's a lot of Populus species. So here's Populus Tremuloides, Quaking Aspen, and I select it. And maybe we want to measure those same measurements, dBH um, and height and dBH in centimeters. Um, for three different species. So if I wanted to also I'll add um, height before I forget and um, then I'll add a second species to this and maybe I want to measure um, subalpine fur, Abies lasiocarpa and if I search and look I might find that subalpine fur and add it to my pick list. So now I've got a pick list of Aspen and subalpine fur, and I want my volunteers to measure these two parameters. So at any given time, I can preview and or save. I might just save this, and it's it was success. We've got a data sheet. I can preview what it's going to look like and what it would look like since it's predefined locations. It offers up the students and citizen scientists opportunities to pick a location and if you pick it, it will zoom to that location and let you submit data for the trees you were asked to submit. So if you go back to your project, you've now got a saved data sheet in your submit data that's called Tree Diameter Citizen Science Data Sheet. Now since I'm demonstrating this on my friend's um, Trout Unlimited project, I'm going to delete this data sheet. But um, that was a good demonstration, hopefully, of how to create a data sheet, edit it, and uh, you can always change it, and you can print it for paper data sheets, and your volunteers would only see the enter and print because they're just members, they're not project coordinators. So they would see these two buttons. So I'm going to delete that because my project friend would be confused. And so here we go. We've now got just our stream monitoring data sheet and we're good to go. So with that, I'm pushing 45 minutes, which is about where I wanted to be. We've seen visualizations. If you click on analyses, you'll see those visualizations I was talking about. Um, and it might load up air temperature or say water temperature or pH, I could do pH, um, and it's going to look at all pH measurements through time that were collected at this project, or I could specifically specify a specific location like Beaver Creek, and I could look at air temperature at Beaver Creek. Um, I can also look at comparisons of different parameters across these different locations, so here's Beaver Run, Beaver Creek, um, and we can look compare say, I don't know, connectivity across these different locations. And we're working on developing um, relationships, which would let you compare relationships between two or more variables. So with that, I'll return to the home page, minimize my screen, and I would, gosh, I'm at about 45 minutes. I'd, I'd welcome um, to have this open up for any questions you might have. So thank you so much for your time. And Beth, are you on? Oh, I yes, I'm here. Can you hear me now? Ah, fantastic. Yeah, I, I unmuted, I think it was Sylvia, she's my doppelganger, um, she somehow got my login um, when she was um, working with the Wyoming teachers, so I think I unmuted her instead of myself. But no, thank you so much, that was great. Um, usually, sometimes the teachers often have questions, but sometimes, oh, there's one, Michelle has a question, is there an approval process for accepting projects? Ah, great question, Michelle. Um, I'll type into chat briefly. Basically, yes. And how that works is when you, if you're logged out um, and you go to the home page and you want to join us, there's this large either register or join us. And join us will take you to this um, 
welcome page and registration page. And if you want to join us as a project coordinator to start your own project, you have to request to become a project coordinator. And as such, we ask a very simple thing. We ask to learn more about your goals um, in your citizen science project. And that is emailed to the webmaster at sitside.org who goes to myself and our team. Um, Russ, Russell Scarpino and Nicole Kaplan who are watching this webinar with me here actually today and we get this email and then we establish a relationship with each of our project coordinators who in turn are given the keys as a gatekeeper for their own project and so we kind of approve projects and each project then approves members or citizen scientists. I see a question from Chip in the chat menu as well. It says, does sitside.org provide opportunities for two or more related projects to learn or collaborate on research efforts? Um, that's actually a, a great question, Chip, and it's a question um, that I think it's a goal of ours to have that type of collaboration occur serendipitously. Fortunately, we've had a few examples of that happen already, and that I would say is one of the best examples would be our PICA projects, in which we had started a project locally in the Colorado Front Range, which was called the Front Range PICA Project. It was a collaboration between the Denver Zoo, the University of Colorado, our researchers there who are PICA biologists, and then our team here at the Natural Resource Ecology Lab at Colorado State University. And the Front Range PICA project started and began collecting data in 2011. Shortly thereafter, in 2012, um, the Oregon Zoo took notice and wanted to collaborate with the Front Range PICA project. Similarly, um, the PICANET project run out of a nonprofit organization called Mountain Studies Institute. Um, down in Durango, Colorado, also took note and wanted to collaborate. So here you have what you're seeing is now, what, four projects kind of following each other's footsteps um, and collaborating and adopting similar protocols to measure um, pica populations and learn from each other. So great question, Chip, and fortunately that is happening in some cases and it is one of our goals. Is the data all separate? though, can you visualize the da those data together or no? Um, good question. So the, the, the question is, is can you visualize the data together that are similar? And the answer is yes, kind of. Um, the, you can cut across projects and look at all data for a given species. And if you did, like in this case, the American pika, you could then ask to get data for all species all observations of that species cutting across projects. And so although they're separate in the sense that they're submitted via these um, different unique projects, they're not separate in that they share a common measurement. So all measurements for diameter at breast height could be accessed in that same way. We're working on some user interface capabilities to get that more easily, like at a click of a button. And we actually would welcome feedback on how different um, organizations would like to cut across, you know, by measurement or by species, et cetera. So it's possible, um, and some of that is happening, and you can do some of that. Um, we're hoping to build features to do more. Great. Is there a, a cost for um, starting a project? Great question. Um, the, for folks, um, the question was, is there a cost? And no, um, it's a free system. Um, and thankfully, we have gracious support from the National Science Foundation to continue to develop, expand, and grow the sitside.org community of practice, if you will. Um, so currently, there is no cost. We don't see that changing. It's our, always been our mentality and, and mode to offer these services for free. Um, our funding model comes from a lot of people are quite interested in researching questions around how citizen science works and what makes it most effective and um, also how to build cyber infrastructure to support um, data integration and sharing and such things. So fortunately we have funding through NSF for this. I'm going to keep asking questions because <laughs> I have a lot of them. You um, bet. So, if I had a project that had, oh, and Michelle has another one on chat afterwards too. 
um, where I guess two questions. One is um, how far apart do the sites have to be? Like if I have multiple wells at a site and they might only be a couple hundred feet apart, would those be different sites? That's a great question. Um, the precision um, can be as great as um, a decimal degree of latitude longitude. So you can go into well, it's at, yeah, it's 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 as precise as you'd like to enter those numbers. Um, so that should be um, doable so long as you have the precision in your you know instrument to record the differences in those lo those wells. Great. And Michelle has a question. Yeah, thanks Michelle. Um, it looks like you're asking, are projects monitored and evaluated? It's a wonderful question. I was just in a meeting with Tina Phillips from the Cornell Lab of Ornithology, one of the you know, preeminent um, labs um, studying and conducting citizen science projects such as eBird and uh, Project Feeder Watch, for example. And Tina is a specialist in citizen science program evaluation. and um, it's our goal. So the, the question is, is our projects monitored and evaluated? And I think the answer is up to each independent project currently. We encourage projects to do program evaluation, but we um, can't in, in any way say that across the board every project is monitored and evaluated. Um, most monitoring come through project coordinators who look at data, they look for anomalies in data submitted and they clean that up through their editing capabilities. Um, they look for outliers through our data exploration tools and most of that is done through our project coordinators. But um, as far as true evaluation is concerned, we have that feedback form. We encourage folks to use it. However, it's up to each project to perform evaluation. It's a great question. Do you find that um, people are starting to enter data like on the site with tablets and that kind mm. of thing? Right. Also a good question. Um, are folks entering data with tablets? So this, the website myself, I've, I've certainly played around with the website on, a, on an iPad, for example, and on my own smartphone, a little Galaxy S3, um, just using the website itself at this point. And um, I've been able to myself enter data just fine using tablet and smartphone um, approaches. Um, as far as the amount of use of those, it's hard for us to know. An observation comes in, it's it's we you know the data the database considers it an observation. However, it comes to us. Um, we do offer that mobile app I mentioned, and it's accessible on the home page. And if you go there and you can click on either the uh, iStore or the Google Play um, Store to get either the iOS uh, iPhone version or the Android. Um, unfortunately, currently our um, mobile apps support a limited subset of all the features I showed to date. So for example, those predefined monitoring locations are not supported, but rather the, the smartphone app detects its current location and helps you by pre-populating your location where you are and fills in your latitude longitude, but you can't pick that plot one versus plot two currently with our version one mobile app. Um, so people are using the mobile app. We know that folks have downloaded it just with metrics from the store. There was a project in Eastern Washington that helped fund um, our initial app development and they are using it for invasive plant monitoring. Um, so I'd say that there's some use of, of tablets and some use of, of smartphones, but by and large, I would say the majority are using paper data sheets because they're quite reliable <laughs> in the field. Yeah. We had a few more comments um, in the chat box too, and I think yeah. Andy had a question. Right. Uh, thanks, Andy. Uh, good to hear from you. Um, and the question was, can project coordinators get support for cleaning up data? It's a very good question, Andy. There is multiple project roles that are allowed, and so when you manage members of a project you're a coordinator of, and for example, if I were to go to this trout project, I think, and I need to log in. Um, if I log in, it'll take me back to where I was. And when I see that, I can see um, that now I can manage these members. And by doing that, I can uh, change these roles. And these roles, like if I go to myself, 
I might have, where did I go? Um, geez, lots of people probably need a sort by. Um, but in any event, you can edit a role. And if you click that, you can see there's a reviewer, an authority, and a manager. This person is a contributor. And the answer to your question would be for cleaning up data, you can approve and kind of crowdsource that cleaning up process by approving certain people as authorities who could then be tasked with cleanup um, if there's mistakes made by you know, those entering data. It's a great question. Yes, one last quick question. Um, you said that you can, if you have previous data, you can add it as tab delimited data. Um, so I'm assuming that means you could, you know, also populate and merge data that might be collected with transducers with human collected data, right? You could, um, absolutely. So if you have like a, a, a hobo weather station that's a microclimate weather station or transducers or these types of instruments that give you export data that then can be put into tabular text data, you could in bulk upload that sensor data. One of our long-term goals is to actually automate that synchronization with the uh, monitoring device itself so that you'll get real-time data flow into SITSI.org from those sensors as well as your human observations. Cool. I'm going to have to talk with you more about that. There's um, a proposal waiting to happen, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much. Any other final questions for Greg? 